today's presentation of Simplifying Desktop Management Using Desktop Authority. Once again, my name is Neil Belfort. I'm one of the system engineers here, and we'll begin the presentation in about 30 seconds. Now, everybody should be able to see my desktop okay. This presentation is done in a muted mode, so I'm pretty much the only one who's speaking at this point. If someone does have a question, please type it into the question field within your GoToWebinar console. I do ask, if at all possible, please try and hold all questions until the end. We should be able to get to uh, all questions pretty timely. Now, if someone doesn't see my desktop, if somebody doesn't hear me okay, please send a question or send an instant message at this point also. But at this time, everybody should see my desktop. I just did bring up and share up my desktop. Once again, for those that have just joined, my name is Neil Belfour. I'm one of the system engineers here at ScriptLogic. And I'll be bringing you today's presentation, Simplifying Desktop Management. We usually handle these presentations. We'll talk about the product for maybe 20 to 30 minutes, and we'll open it up to a QA after at that point. I usually do like to start out these presentations by talking a little bit about the installation, because Desktop Authority is a product that can't be downloaded from scriptlogic.com. Well, how cumbersome, how complicated is the installation of the product? It's not that difficult. Once you would go to run Desktop Authority and the most current version, is 8.12, and we're looking at the manager. This is what it would look like after it is installed. But the first thing it would prompt you for is a Microsoft SQL Server. SQL 2005, 2008 is fine. Express versions, no problem. We'll create two databases on that database server. They're both going to be very small. One is for reporting, one is for configuration. The second thing it likes to do is prompt you for credentials. Who do you want to be able to manage desktop authority? You could always put in role-based administration credentials later after the install. The last thing it likes to do is deploy a service to all of your domain controllers. Optimally, desktop authority is doing that for trying to create more of a no single point of failure environment. But if there's a policy in place that prevents agents from being deployed to domain controllers, no problem. We can be set up as a full member server installation at that point. Now you're ready to go with desktop authority. When you open up the console and 8.12 is the most current version, this is what it would look like. We break it down to quite a few categories, but how do we apply settings? How do settings eventually get down to the client machine? Well, we divide those into profiles. Profiles are broken down into two categories, computer management profiles and user management profiles based upon the task that you're trying to accomplish on the client machine or to the user is what type of profile you would set that up in. So to get a good understanding of how desktop authority works, I'm going to expand user management profiles at this point. Now once I expand user management profiles, you can see I have multiple profiles set up. One would be for my domain level, one would be maybe a separate office, a separate domain, a separate OU within my Active Directory, it can mirror many different types of objects. But when I expand the profile, is I see all the settings that are capable within that profile. Now, how do settings get down to the client machine? Now, this is just from a user management profile standpoint. This type of code uses a targeting system. I've always called it a targeting system called validation logic. Validation logic targets either machines and or users based upon a host of criteria. Let's work on a hierarchical structure. There are child profiles that you could build inside of parent profiles if you wanted to, but you're using a hierarchical structure at this point. If you don't validate the profile level, it makes no difference what you have on the tab level itself, the setting is not going to apply. Now you'll notice at the profile level here, I have if authenticating domain star. Okay, that's a pretty generic type of uh, validation. Pretty much any user who authenticates in this domain is going to look into this profile. That's correct. And if they fit the class of machine, the OS, the connection type, the timing, all agreed, they're going to look inside this profile to see what other types of settings that they should get. Or what are other ways that we can validate? Well, let's simply add a validation logic rule, such as network membership, authenticating domain we've covered, computer domain, 
computer groups, and it does support wildcards in these fields. OUs, OU users, primary groups, AD sites, user groups, and user names. You could always use our resource browser to browse to the specific group that you would want to populate. This computer information, such as computer name, host address, MAC address, specific subnet, file exists, versions, IP ranges, registry keys, values, virtual environments, platform types, terminal services. Maybe I'm running just a terminal server. Maybe I'm running a Citrix published app. There's also custom validation logic, which takes on about 200 or so variables that are always an F2 keystroke away, and we break these down by category, such as Active Directory, Applications, Date and Time, Disk and Folders, and another common one would be Operating System and even System itself. Now, if I broke it down based upon Active Directory, maybe I would want to validate a setting for all users in a specific city if that attribute is popular with an Active Directory. That's how granular we can get with validation logic when applying settings. You can also combine all these settings with not statements, or statements, and and statements to really create a sense of validation logic. But how does everything work within Desktop Authority when you want to build a setting? So let's take one of the most simplest settings within Desktop Authority, a drive mapping. Once I highlight the drive mapping tab, I would right mouse click in the view pane and create a new element. Once that new element is created, the Settings tab becomes enabled. Okay. Now, in this case, I've chosen the Accounting Drive. I put in the description, Accounting Drive. In the Settings, I'm choosing an iDrive. I put in the UNC path for that drive. I gave it a label so the end user knows what it's for. And now I'm going to validate it for who I want it to validate for. Now, in this case, if you're a member of the Accounting Group and the Finance Group, and in this specific subnet, you would get the accounting drive mapped to this path. If this path happens to change, no problem. It's no longer one, two, three, four, five. Maybe it's six, seven, eight, nine. I would simply save that setting, apply that setting, and replicate it. And once that setting finishes replication, based upon my timing is when that setting would occur. It's as simple as that to set up configuration settings within desktop authority. Now, how can we help within an existing environment? Well, when most people say to me, you're running an Active Directory environment, how are you managing your desktops within an Active Directory environment? In many cases, it's group policies. We'll be using group policies extensively, maybe minimally, maybe, yeah, we have a few of them. Okay. You'll notice we have a tab called Group Policy Templates. And I skipped over a lot of other tabs. If someone does have a question on a tab that I did miss, no problem, because we really try and give this presentation more as like a 20,000 foot overview. You'll notice Group Policy Templates. By default, Desktop Authority will import all of the ADM files for a 2003 domain or the ADMX files for a 2008 domain, whichever you are running. But that doesn't mean you can't add customized ADM templates from both, even if you're not running that type of infrastructure. But since I am running a 2008 R2, I will stay with the ADMX files at this point. If I wanted to import a customized ADMX file, no problem, I would add it right here. But anyone that's already in my existing infrastructure, I can simply add and import that easily. Now, if I go back to my settings, what's the biggest advantage here? Well, in a group policy environment, you're really limited at three levels. Group policies can be applied at the domain level, the OU level, and the site level. So what does that eventually lead to? In many cases, it leads to a fragmented active directory, or it leads to many more group policies than you need because you really don't have a true targeting system to be able to put the settings where they need to go. So if I expand my administrative templates, and I can choose a nice, easy group policy setting, such as prohibit access to control panel. Maybe I would want to configure prohibiting access to control panel. 
So now I would choose to drop down here and I would enable that setting. So far it looks similar to it with policy. Well, who would I want this setting to be applied to? How about my validation logic? How about if you are a computer OU, DA machines? Okay, so all computers in this computer OU would be given this setting. That's true. But we want to disable control panel on certain machines. Control panels changed on Vista and Windows 7. So I want to change it on those machines. Okay. But I also only want to change it on my notebooks because they're the ones that travel outside the office quite a bit. Okay. So I'm only going to put it on this OU and these. But I'm going to put in something else because I don't want domain admins to be affected by something along these lines. So now I'm going to put in a user group and drop down to domain admins. And we'll put in a little not statement. So now all machines in that OU will be affected unless your group, a member of the domain admins group, or even if it's not a portable, a Vista or 7 machine. That's how easy it is to leverage the power of validation logic over group policy settings. I don't have to create multiple group policies, link them into multiple OUs, move users from OU to OU, computer from OU to OU, academic. It's as easy as that. Now, even going a little further along with this, we talked about how else can we manage from a cost savings. Well, many organizations today have green initiatives. And a lot of times it's not even the organization itself, a lot of times it's the state that is starting the green initiatives and even offering incentives through the power company to be able to do something. Well, the first thing we can help with is managing power and setting up power schemes. So once again, I highlight a tab within a profile. I would right mouse click in the view pane, create a new element. And with my power schemes, I created a separate power scheme for notebooks and a separate power scheme for desktops. But really when it comes to power schemes, if I can control power within my infrastructure on a desktop and notebook policy, I can save the organization money. There's power plan settings for Vista and Windows 7 and power scheme settings for XP machines. And you'll notice the validation logic is what signifies what policies I want to apply to what machines. So once again, if you can control power, you can eliminate certain costs. And we do have reporting built into Desktop Authority to show you some of these cost savings. Now, remote management. Remote management is also, when I speak to many people, how are you remote managing a machine? How are you taking control of it? Well, maybe they're using a tool like a VNC. A lot of people are using RDP. Well, how do you create an interactive session for the user? Interactive session. The first thing is I'm going to go to my remote management tab. I also kept this very simple. I set up a company-wide remote policy. We want to play an agent over port 2000, you could choose any port within your infrastructure, access control. Maybe I would want to give a junior admin limited ability what they can do on a client machine. No problem. There is advanced settings that I can deploy out while the agent is being deployed. And when it comes to remote managing a machine, how do I remote manage a machine? There are three ways to remote manage a machine. I can browse to it in the console under remote management up here. And right mouse click on it, remote manage the machine. I can bring up a web console. Desktop Authority comes with a web console for remote management. That remote management is also gateway enabled through the web console. So if you wanted to remote manage a machine directly over the internet, no problem. Or within your LAN, I can simply bring up any browser, put in a computer name and or IP address, and remote manage into that machine and take control of it. Now, I'm going to call this a remote session at this point because at this time, all we've done is establish a remote session to this client machine. Everything I do in the background on this SQ7 machine at, from this view is done in the background. The user doesn't know what I'm doing. So if I want to do a file transfer to that client machine, 
No problem. I can do a drop and drag from one machine to the other. I can initiate a help desk chat. I can bring up computer management, such as file manager, user manager, the event viewer, what services are running, what processes are running, registry editor. I can even bring up a command prompt. And when I bring up a command prompt, by default, it's done with elevated permissions. Performance monitoring, such as CPU load, memory load, open files. Well, you know what? I'm here. Let me take a look at installed applications. Now I can also run a software inventory report and get a good idea. But now I'm here. Let's just take a look. But this user just called up to the help desk with uh, a problem that, an error that keeps popping up. Well, you know what? Let me see what they say. So let me hit remote control, and now I see their desktop. It does have dual windows, dual monitor support, screen resolution support. We do use a mirror driver, so no matter what the resolution is on the client machine, I can guarantee I'm seeing it in full screen. Also, blank out their display support. Maybe you have to do something on their client machine you really don't want them to see. You can blank it out. And when done, just simply click in remote session, and your session is done. Now, going back, still talking a little bit about security, because we spent a certain amount of time with group policy templates. Even remote management is a certain amount from a secure standpoint. USB port security. USB port security is an initiative in most organizations. A lot of organizations don't know how to tackle it at this point or what policies to have in place, but this type of policy is offering you a utility to maybe help you make that decision a little easier. Now, what is USB port security supposed to be doing? It's supposed to lock down either USB devices and or ports. Once again, I right mouse click, create an element, but here's a little different. You create permission sets. And you'll notice my admin's permission set I've applied to the domain admins. Whereas my sales permission set I've applied to sales. Okay. And I edit the permission set. You'll notice my admins have full control over everything. Well, my sales has pretty much limited control over everything. Well, what can we lock down? What can we control? Well, Blackberry devices, Bluetooth, CD, DVD readers, writers, firewire, hard disk drives, MP3 players, removable storage, USB devices such as printers, scanners, storage, unclassified USB devices, so I'm plugged in an iPhone, a droid, Wi-Fi devices. You can also disable all USB devices except human interface devices, but you choose how you want to lock it down. We even go a little further. We're logging this information. So if a user would happen to plug in their iPhone and copy maybe sensitive files onto that, we're going to let you know what files they copied onto that phone to. There is device exceptions. You can set up a black white list if you chose to. Well, these are the approved drives for our infrastructure, and these are the only ones you can use. It's an administrative override. Maybe I would want to set up an administrative override that when an admin goes to somebody's desk, they can always type in this password and bypass all USB security. USB port security. Now, we spent a certain amount of time on user management profiles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over to computer management profiles. When I expand computer management profiles, so far, it looks very similar to user management profiles. But wait till I do one more expansion on a profile. Wow, there's a lot less tabs in here. It's true, because these are settings which we deem computer-specific. And what is computer-specific settings? Well, software deployment, patch deployment, registry modifications in a case, data collection from a hardware inventory standpoint, wake on LAN. All of this is included for the computer service pack deployment. These are usually not settings that are user-specific. Can they be applied that way? Yes, they can be, but we're calling them computer management because computer-based management has a little more flexibility to it. You'll see what I mean. The first thing I would want to touch upon is MSI packages. Okay, well, 
maybe I need you to play an application using Desktop Authority. We have an updated version of Adobe Reader. Maybe we just got a new application in-house. We got a new application called Desktop Authority Secure Password Extension. It's really called Desktop Authority Password Self-Service. It's a very inexpensive tool. It's almost an optional plugin for Desktop Authority, which gives the user the ability via a secure web console to answer challenge questions and reset their Active Directory passwords. I would right mouse click, create a view pane. No problem. The settings tab becomes enabled. I would select the package that I've published in Desktop Authority that I want to deploy. In this case, how about Adobe Reader? Nice, easy. I chose an action to install. I published a transform file for this product. How to create an MST file for it so Adobe Reader goes through with a nice silent install. And we do make a packaged product called Desktop Authority MSI Studio. Very inexpensive. Can help you create the transform files for existing MSIs. We use a distribution server methodology. This is where if you have multiple offices, you can control where that end user client gets this application from. What's the first step? Well, how about validation logic? Let's determine who needs to get this. Well, this is Adobe Reader 8. Well, how about if you're in this subnet and you're running version 7? Maybe in that subnet, I already have users that are running version 8. Why well, spend time trying to upgrade them? So now I'm only going to look for version 7 and in this subnet. Okay, that's the first rule of validation logic. Well, when's all this going to occur? When dealing with computer-based management, you set up an actual timing for the setting to occur. So I've scheduled the setting. I can use a custom schedule or even a named schedule if I want to set it up as a recurring. I'm going to cycle it once. It's only an application deployment. I don't need it to run daily. 2 a.m. on May 12th. Okay. That's when it's all going to take place. And you'll notice a little optional setting down here. If computer is unavailable to schedule time, run as soon as the computer becomes available. So now we're going to deploy Acrobat Reader in this subnet only from this distribution server on May 12th at 2 a.m. in the morning. There are execution options. I had to choose the middle of the night for this application deployment. But if I wanted to do this during the middle of the day, there are certain options, such as asking a user's permission and rebooting after the element executes. But desktop authority sold me so much on the fact that green initiative, let's shut down these machines and save power. Let's control power on them. It's true. Okay, well, we're saving power. We're shutting them down. How do I wake them up to be able to deploy an application? That's where our wake on LAN deployment comes in. Wake on LAN deployment is the only setting within desktop authority that treats validation logic different. Validation logic is different. It's not acting as the targeting system using desktop authority. Validation logic, when wake on LAN, is using a little bit different. The machine you choose to act as the validation logic point is a beaconing machine. This is acting as the beacon to send out the happy packets to wake up the client machines on that segment of the network. So I chose exact machine within a segment of my network to act as the beacon to wake up what other machines. Well, here I can do them based upon machine names, MAC addresses, IP addresses, no problem. Now I'm going to wake them up. When am I going to wake them up? Well, how about on May 12th at 1.30 a.m.? Wake them up about a half hour before the application needs to be deployed, such as Adobe Reader. Now, how does this play in with patch deployment? Well, the same thing. Patch deployment is using a similar technology that our MSI packages is. Our MSI packages is using a distribution server methodology. Patching takes it one step further. Not just using a distribution server methodology, it's using a distribution slash download methodology. This way you can choose what server you want to act as a distribution point as well as a download point. I've set up a client patch policy. My validation logic would be this subnet. Well, this subnet's going to use this distribution server. Timing, when do I want to scan my machines? Well, now we're dealing with patching. We're not dealing with a one-time release. So now I'm scheduling it. 
weekly, 3 a.m. on Thursdays. I want to scan my machines, port patches, and deploy them. Execution options, bottom line, reboot after element executes. That's why I'm doing my patching at 3 a.m. in the morning. I don't want people to defer them. But if I had to, can I give them the ability to defer? Yes, I can. And I can give them the ability to defer a certain amount of times. Severity filters, product filters. This is where the biggest thing comes in. You're going to notice, I mentioned group policies. Yeah, it's a native tool. So is WSUS. Both pretty adequate tools on what they're trying to do. You'll notice something that's not in WSUS. That's something that's here. Third-party products, such as Adobe, Citrix, Apple products, Google, HP. Let's even go a little further. Java. Now, of course, you're going to see Exchange, Office, Project. You're going to see all the Microsoft stuff, too. MSN Messenger, Oracle, Real VNC, Shavlik, Skype, SunJava, VMware, WinZip, all third-party products that we support from a patching standpoint. Uses the same distribution server methodology, takes a little further enhancement of it, Computer-based management also has the ability to patch service if you didn't pick up on that when you saw uh, Microsoft Exchange. Now, once again, I mentioned reporting. I even mentioned that one of the first things of this presentation would create two databases. Let's bring up the reporting database. The reporting database is auditing from a start administrative audits. Who's doing what in desktop authority? There is an anti-spyware, anti-malware piece to desktop authority. Hardware inventory, miscellaneous reports, primarily wrapped around power management savings, patch management status, profiles, why well, one on one reports on my settings. I mean, I got a million drive mappings in here. How do I know which ones I'm trying to see? Where are they validating? Software inventory. Okay, well, you know what? Let me pull up the software inventory list. How about just total installations? All of these reports can be customized, edited, it can be scheduled to run its times, individual dates, times, email to individual people, also in a variety of formats. And you'll notice there if you wanted to edit the query, now based upon the report that you're trying to run is what filter parameters are going to be available. And I just ran this as a general software inventory total installation. So from a quick eyeball test, I can see how many licenses I have of my applications within my infrastructure. Once again, very easy to export. HTML, PDF, XML would be the most popular. Software management. Well, maybe I deployed an application out. How about a software summary? Maybe even detailed by product. Now I would just have to pull up a package name. And in this case, how about Adobe Reader? Let's see how it went. And I can see that the install failed on Adobe Reader. USB port security. The file access log. That's where you would look to see who copied things off onto it, what they've copied off and on. User activity. Maybe I want to track logons. We get that all the time. Well, you know what? I see everybody... Goes out, everybody's allowed a 15 minute smoke break in the morning. Okay. Well, why do I see at least 10 people where the machines are locked for 45 minutes when they're only allowed a 15 minute smoke break? We can pull it down user activity per computer or just simply user activity. And you can track them based upon locks, logons, log offs, and what their local privilege is and domain privilege on those computers. Let's go back a little bit further and maybe we can see some uh, information in that report. Let's go back a little bit. How about all the way to the beginning of the year? Should have something in it at that point. Wow. Okay, a lot in it at this point. And you could track the log on, log off, and locks of machines. You could see their local privileges and their domain privilege. So very easy. And this would be on a user called Al Pacino. So once again, you can track them. 
If you wanted to build your own reports, go to User Define Report, bring up our reporting wizard, and choose a category for that report. Simple as that. I did mention there is role-based administration built within Desktop Authority. If you really wanted to lock down what users had or what junior admins had ability in the console, no problem. Once again, my name is Neil Belfort. I'm one of the system engineers here at ScriptLogic. Desktop Authority is available for download from ScriptLogic.com.